The battle to save the 62-year-old dormitory lasted all night and most of this morning. But almost from the outset, fire officials knew that the best they could hope for was to keep the fire from spreading to nearby buildings. As you can see, looking around, we've got something that are relatively close. We had a lot of problem with embers and, and that sort of thing. We, we took uh, the normal precautions with that. Uh, the amount of fire that we had and the location of the fire is what really gave us a problem. Uh, we had a, a concealed ceiling that uh, was located throughout the building that the fire itself burnt uh, horizontally and vertically to an extent that when, once we opened it up and ventilated it, uh, we had all the fire that we want. Uh, you know, for everybody. But in battling this blaze, the firefighters ran into yet another enemy. An enemy that Chief Bailey says made fighting the fire doubly difficult. In almost every situation, firefighters have to contend with extreme heat. This fire was different, for they had to contend with extreme cold. The first uh, crew of men were, we had to actually pry the gloves off in the hands to get them off, to put new gloves on the, on the hands. The gloves were, were frozen right, you know, right to the skin. By late morning, the combined fire units from Williamsburg and surrounding communities had the blaze under control. But officials expect mop-up operations to continue through tomorrow. At this point, Chief Bailey says he has no clues as to the origin of the fire, but adds that arson has been virtually ruled out. John Fisher, News 3, Williamsburg. A crisis can bring out the best in people. It probably did in Williamsburg today. Firemen were still fighting the blaze when school officials began picking up the pieces. It's the Williamsburg Motor Lodge. What to do with 190 people who'd lost everything? Shelter, clothes, books, everything. A um, pair of binoculars and I had a mounted deer head. I had three musical instruments and about 240 books. Mid-morning, at least the basics were taken care of. Lodging had been arranged at the nearby Motorhouse Motel. Roommates would even stay together. We're still getting phone calls from local motel owners and hotel owners volunteering space, and uh, we had those calls early this morning, and promises of food and, and clothing as well. By 2 p.m., the college had begun replacing textbooks that were now ashes. The Red Cross said it would pick up part of the tab through its disaster relief fund, as it will for clothes at a local department store. Casey's kicked in a 10% discount. The students came, some barefoot, some still wrapped in blankets. Probably down the other end, but probably the best. And in the basement of the student center, clothing donations poured in from other students, from citizens, from retailers, as the community pulled together. This came from the Unicorn, which is one of the stores here in town, and they contributed brand new clothing. Tags are still on it. The whole affair, of course, is a very tragic one, but the community has been donating. None of us can thank them enough. So although the building is gone and everything in the rooms, the clothing, the books, the hi-fis, everything is gone, the students here know it could have been much worse. I guess we're just lucky to be allowed to get out. I know there's two guys in our hall that almost did.
Shots off the ladder. This blackened and ugly mess once was Jefferson Hall. I'm standing on the first floor, what used to be the first floor, on a spot in the floor that caved in while firemen were right here. But it represents the last part of the building that was not a total loss. And ironically, not far away, also at the edge of the worst of the fire, the spot at which officials say the blaze began. Uh, it originated in a uh, kitchen behind a refrigerator. Uh, we haven't determined what, what the malfunction in the refrigerator was. It was either a short or a bad compressor or motor or something. Uh, the fire spread from behind the refrigerator down into the floor and the ceiling above the basement. And Duffy and investigators from the state police and the Williamsburg Fire Department finished their work around midday. Now what's left of Jefferson Hall is back in the hands of the college. Cameraman Mike Ridge got these up-close bird's-eye views of just how bad the damage is. College officials are still trying to determine exactly what can be done with the building. But at a morning news conference, they did have some good news, one glimmer of hope. Uh, as for salvage, we have received word that it does appear that at least some of the rooms on the east end of the building uh, may have items in them that are salvageable. Oh, Patty, yes. good luck! Oh. You got your typewriter? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Past the fire lines and through the puddles came a stream of freshman women to salvage what was left, sometimes aided by firemen. When buildings and fire rooms comes in here, they're going to box all your stuff as much as salvageable. Other crews joined in the effort, packing each room in numbered boxes, and amidst the rubble, moments of joy and triumph. Some students emerged with only one precious object, often to the cheers of their friends, a stuffed animal, or for Debbie, a musician, something even more important. My flute, that's all, that's all I wanted. And your flute came out all right? Well, it's a little bit rusty, but it'll do. At the College of William and Mary, Terry Zahn, The Daily News.